welcome everyone to Ask the Expert. We um, are very excited to speak with Teresa Dittoni. She's a PhD candidate at the University of Miami and the DRI or Diabetes Research Institute. And her, um, she also has a master's in pharmaceutical chemistry and technologies from University Degli Studi di, di Padova. I'll let her tell you more about that. Um, and she's very um, involved in, in the Islet Immuno, uh, Immuno Engineering Lab at the DRI, uh, where she's uh, participating in the development and characterization of biomaterials for pancreatic islet immunoisolation as a therapeutic option for type 1 diabetes patients. So very, very big welcome to you today, Teresa. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be involved uh, um, with the sugar science uh, community. Fantastic. Um, um, and so do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of what your, um, you know, what led you to the, to the field of study you're in right now at the DRI? Yes, sure. Um, so um, when I was in my undergrad studies, I was actually babysitting as a side job, a type one diabetes child. Um, and the mother of this child is here uh, in the audience. Um, Fantastic, welcome. And uh, so I understood that what I was actually studying could uh, be useful for type one diabetes research. And therefore, I contacted um, Dr. Camillo Ricordi, asking him if I could um, come to the Diabetes Research Institute um, to do my thesis for my master. And he welcomed here. Um, and so I came and then I stayed for my PhD. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Dr. Camillo Ricordi is a, a very a big name in type 1 diabetes research. He's done a lot of um, very uh, innovative and, um, you know, I'd say important research that has pushed the field forward in spe specifically in islet implantation. So that's fantastic. You're in a great, um, a great setting to, to really learn more and push the ball forward in this type of research. So yeah, do you want to dive right into your slides or? Yes, sure. Great. So today we'll uh, talk a little bit about my research and what I've been doing uh, as a part of my um, graduate studies. Um, so as we all know, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease uh, in which we, we have distractions of the beta cells, which are the insulin producing cells. Without these cells, um, there is absence of insulin and therefore the glucose cannot enter the cells and there is an increased blood glucose. Um, current treatments, unfortunately, are just palliative. There is no cure for the disease and the patients no need to self-monitor uh, their blood glucose um, through um, blood glucose monitoring systems and they have to self-inject with um, insulin pen or through a pump system. However, as we can see from this graph, even with the best treatments, it is very hard to maintain normal glycemia and uh, uncontrolled diabetes can lead to long-term chronic and life-threatening complications. Islet transplantation may cure type one diabetes, but um, unfortunately, um, as of now, it is available just for those patients that suffer of hyperglycemia and awareness, severe hypoglycemic episodes, and glycemic liability. Um, the islets are uh, obtained from a uh, disease donor pancreas. The pancreas uh, is placed into the recording chamber and the islets are isolated through it. Um, after purification and culture, the islets are then um, introduced into the portal vein in the liver. Um, we um, know that um, these procedure help patients reestablish establishing the physiological insulin secretion and reducing the long-term side effects of type 1 diabetes. Um, in addition to this, the transplant procedure is less invasive than the entire organ transplantation. However, as for every transplant, there is a need of lifelong immunosuppressive treatments um, to prevent the rejection of the graft. And this in the long-term 
um, can uh, um, increase the susceptibility of the patients to infections um, and other diseases. Uh, moreover, the transplanted graft is not retrievable and there is a scarcity of donor. In our laboratory, we are focusing in trying to find uh, a way to overcome the need of lifelong immunosuppressive treatments, and we are doing it through microencapsulation platforms, uh, which are barrier um, the, um, or capsules um, around the eyelids that um, protect the eyelids from the immune system while being uh, permeable to glucose, nutrients, oxygen, and insulin. Um, the goal of my studies was um, to identify strengths and weaknesses of some of the promising encapsulation platforms in order to understand how to better create um, a micro um, immune isolating platforms for eyelid transplantation um, that can go into patients. Uh, so the um, capsules that we studied were um, alginate single capsules and double capsules using different type of alginates and uh, with or without polylysine, which is a permaselective membrane that show to protect um, uh, by um, the um, show to protect the eyelids uh, from the contact with the IgG. The other platforms that we study is polyethylene glycon conformal coating. Um, so the first thing that we did was uh, going to uh, study um, what happens um, to the eyelids once they were encapsulated. And we did it by measuring the eyelid size within the uh, capsules and by measure the capsule size. So as we observe, um, there is no significance different among the different groups. So the conformal coating capsules, eyelid size, and the alginate uh, eyelid size after encapsulation, which is good because it means that the um, procedure of the, of the encapsulation is gentle um, in the eyelids. We then compared the capsule size and we observed that there is a significantly um, different size among the um, alginate capsules and the conformal coating capsules. And finally, we observe that the conformal coating capsules um, size depend on the diameter of the eyelids, while the alginate capsule size do not depend on the eyelids diameter. Um, after evaluating these characteristics, we went on and we measured the functionality of the human eyelids encapsulating into the different um, capsules, and to do so, we did a, a dynamic glucose-stimulated insulin secretion assays. So we stimulated the eyelids with different concentrations of glucose through this machine, and we measured the insulin secretion through ELISA. Um, and what we saw was that increasing the size of the capsules, we were increasing the delay uh, of the insulin and the presence of the permaselective membrane, which is polylysine, increases the delay of insulin secretions as well. While the conformal coating capsules here in red had a similar profile to the non-coated eyelids in uh, black. After this, we transplanted our uh, coated um, eyelids and we, um, we plan to do it into the fat pad of the um, mice, and we mixed it with plasma and thrombin to create a gel that seals the eyelids and um, make sure that the eyelids do not go around. And we were able to do so with the conformal coated human eyelids because the volume of the capsules to be transplanted was small enough. However, we were not able to do so with the alginate capsules because um, they are uh, larger. And so the volume that needed to be transplanted wasn't small enough to be able to transplant it into, into the fat pad. And therefore, we decided to transplant it into the interperitoneal cavity of the mice. 
we evaluated um, the glucose after um, transplantation, and we observed that the conformal coated human islets had a similar and comparable profile to the non coated human islets. And uh, arginine capsules were able to reverse diabetes um, into the intraperitoneal cavity. However, we observed that, as you can see here in red, we had low glycemia um, in some of the alginate uh, capsules. And this is not good neither. So we went on and we analyzed the tissues post-explantation, and we observed that the um, islet size in alginate capsules was smaller compared to uh, prior transplantation. We also observed that in single capsules and double capsules retrieved from, from the interperitoneal cavity had a higher proportion of beta cells and a lower proportion of alpha cells than human islets in non-coated and conformal coating grafts. And this could be a reason of low glycemia in those uh, mice. In addition to this, we observed that there weren't uh, MAC2 positive cells inside of the capsules. However, um, there was presence of MAC2 positive cells around the conformal coated uh, grafts. So uh, we wanted to understand more their behavior of this capsule. And to do so, we went to mm, in silico modeling. And um, we used console multiphysic. We measured the diffusion permeability of uh, fluorescent insulin and glucose through the capsules, um, through FRAP analysis. We uh, used the um, size measurements found previously, and we put this data we, uh, in our uh, console multiphysic model. And we uh, used a parallel um, in uh, glucose-stimulated insulin secretion assay in silico. And as in vitro, we observed that the larger the capsules, the larger was the delay in insulin secretion. And that as in vitro, the polylysin was increasing the delay in insulin secretion. Interestingly, what we saw was also that uh, around the islets that were encoded and the conformal coated um, islets, the uh, glucose was rapidly cleared while it was remaining within the capsules for longer time around the um, islets. And this um, could lead to shutting down uh, the um, glucagon producing stuff. And so it could be a reason for hypoglycemia um, in uh, the mice. Uh, we wanted to understand if uh, um, the reason of our um, non-physiological insulin secretion was due to the type of material that we used or to the type of, to the size of this capsule. So we took the parameters of the alginate uh, capsules and we changed their size making them the same size of the conformal coated islands. And we observed that the insulin secretion was the same as the uh, non-coated um, islets. So we concluded that the alginate capsules, um, because of their size and the presence of polylysin, um, they increase the delay in insulin secretion. Unfortunately, the transplant um, cannot be confined in, in smaller and vascularized site. The alginate capsules could lead to cell death and um, to hyperinsulinemia. And that uh, conformal protein capsules um, have a physiological insulin secretion. However, we saw that their functionality is very variable in vivo and that uh, MAC2 cells can accumulate around their uh, capsules, and these could lead a decrease in their biocompatibility, which in the long term could decrease their functionality. Uh, we concluded that the capsule size of the alginate 
capsules should be minimized to allow a transplantation in confined sites and providing physiological insulin secretion and improving the metabolic control. Um, however, the biocompatibility of the small capsule should be um, improved by using a localized immunomodulation. Um, I want to thank all the people that have been helping me through um, this project and throughout my PhD, including the, um, our collaborators, uh, my lab mates, my PI, um, the different course here at the DRI, and the different funding agency. And thank you all for your attention. That was fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Teresa. That was really interesting. I, um, it's a very detailed study and a very carefully constructed study. You sort of went piece by piece and really made the case for each of those models. Um, I guess I would ask, you know, and let's open it up to questions from the audience also, but, um, you know, can you frame your work sort of in context of um, the other BME strategies that are currently ongoing right now? You know, where, uh, how is this gonna inform? I mean, it's a little bit like you've got some negative data there, but also some positive mm -hmm. data. So how can this inform, you know, what's happening right now with eyelid implantation? You know, you've got Viasite, you've got Vertex, you know, those are sort of neck and neck with eyelid implantation or, you know, mm -hmm. you know in, the, in the corporate setting or in the industry setting. And you've got other laboratories um, around the globe really working to try to solve this issue. And so how do you feel like, you know, this, you know, this can sort of, I mean, obviously we said, you said that you've got to get a smaller size and yes. you've got to get a local, um, localized immunosuppression. Like how, what, what would be the next steps? to investigate, I guess. Um, so this was actually the first goal <laughs> within my uh, dissertation. Um, what I'm trying to do right now is um, using a localized immune isolation approach together with these conformal coated eyelids. Um, the reason why I decided to choose the conformal coated eyelids versus the alginate encapsulation was because I need a small platform in order to maintain a physiological insulin secretion. Um, and we had one already uh, that it needs to be improved in order to arrive to uh, a clinical applicability. Um, and we also know that um, we need a sort of platforms that have to contain um, these eyelids in case we will need one day to retrieve them. So the conformal coating capsules could be transplanted into confined and reachable sites. Um, and they maintain the eyelids within themselves. So if we have to think about a stem cell approach, um, by using a microencapsulation approach that could contain the eyelids within them, um, we wouldn't be worrying about uh, what happens to these cells after being transplanted into the body or in the mice first and then into bigger um, animal models and maybe in the future into the cl a clinical setting. Yeah, and I wondered if, um... Was there any evidence in your work uh, that you followed things out long enough to sort of see any evidence of um, teratomas arising? Um, we uh, encapsulated uh, eyelids and we were able to um, have them in, in the mice model for longer than 100 days and we didn't observe um, teratoma formation. Uh, however, uh, we saw that changing animal model, um, such as um, rat model, we observed a higher inflammation due to the biomaterial and to the higher reactions of the immune system. Um, and so that's why it is very important for us to find a localized approach that actually 
can be combined with the capsules in order to uh, decrease the inflammation once these ones are transplanted. Of course, you are implanting something that is foreign, so you are expecting an immune reaction. We want to decrease this as much as possible so that we don't have a, fib a cell attachment around the capsules because with this cell attachment that could grow around the capsules, then we form decrease the oxygenation, decrease the uh, insulin diffusions and the glucose diffusion. So we would basically lose uh, the goal. Uh, yeah. We yeah, no, that's, yeah, that it, it's a very complex problem. And I, I mean, I think you really have shown, I mean, for a PhD thesis, this is some really, really fine work and very thorough. Um, I wonder if anyone from the audience would like to ask um, a question. I see that Lucy Walker is here and yeah, I'd like to, if she can unmute herself or I can unmute her, let's see. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, very interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you about, um, obviously eyelets come in lots of different sizes, the, the range is quite broad. And um, I think there's been some discussion about perhaps smaller eyelets being better in transplantation settings compared to the larger ones. Is that something that you've looked at at all in this system? Did you find any differences between the smaller and, and larger eyelets in your encapsulation experiments? We have not looked at that, but um, the conformal coating uh, capsules, they are special because they can, their size depends on the eyelet size. So if you have a bigger eyelet, you have a capsule that has the same size of the eyelet. And if your eyelet is very small, then the, the capsule would will be small as well. So I guess that the functionality of these eyelets would um, be similar to the functionality of the non-coated eyelets, but we have not looked at that yet. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and in terms of, you know, I know Alice Tomei is um, doing, you know, you're, you're um, collaborating with her um, to do some of this work. Um, how, uh, what is she's actually my PI. Oh, she's your PI. Okay. Fantastic. She's wonderful. I wondered, um, if you, um, you know, have you guys mapped out your next set of experiments or, you know, what are you, what's next for you? So I am, um, what I'm doing right now, um, is using these nano drug delivery systems. Um, and I am, um, making some experiments to see if these nanodrug delivery systems can actually target the sites of inflammations. And so I'm comparing um, in a mouse model, um, I'm comparing um, the, the inflammation caused by the conformal coating eyelids post-implantation. And um, I'm making um, a scaffold with LPS that is known to cause inflammation. Um, and I am targeting the two uh, sites with this nanodrug delivery system containing anti-inflammatory drugs and seeing if these are actually efficient in decreasing the inflammation. And we had some interesting, interesting results so far. So um, I'm excited to see what's next and to see how um, and what we can um, make out of it. Yeah, no, that'll be very interesting. I can't wait mm -hmm. to see what you guys come up with at either at your next poster or if you publish it, um, we'll definitely be keeping you on the radar and watching what you do. Um, your work is very, as I said before, really finely done and, and really thoughtfully done. And you've really, you know, you kind of, you march through all the, all the questions very carefully. So um, I wondered, I'm going to open it up one more time for any more questions. I see a few more people just joined us. Uh, feel free to raise your hand or just and unmute. Feel, and you can also feel free to contact me after the presentation and to connect with me on LinkedIn. Yeah, privately. Or That's dreaming. great too. Um, okay. Um, I wondered, I guess I'll say, uh, 
what do you, in, in terms of, um, you know, finishing up your PhD, are you just, are you getting closer? Yes, I, in theory, I should graduate this August. Okay, that's so yes, good. That's I'm very great. close. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's crunch time. And so then um, do you have any thoughts of what you might be entertaining for a postdoc? I mean, it seems like you have a lot of skill sets you could bring to a postdoc. Um, I would like to go into industry and maybe do a postdoc uh, in industry. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. A great, uh, I think a lot of um, young scientists are trying that and I think it, it is, um, it really rounds out your education, right? If you've been in academia and then you, you sort of sample how things are done in industry, mm -hmm. you can sort of make decisions going forward where you want to end up. So that's, that's really interesting. And I think there's a few people from industry on this talk. Um, and then they will be listening uh, to it after. I know that does happen as well. We have a lot of views and listens um, via podcast and, you know, on our YouTube channel. So um, you know, maybe you'll get some connections there. That would be fantastic. Um, I guess I'll just, we'll leave it here. Uh, I'll say, you know, once again, really enjoyed having you and uh, best of luck to you. And we'll be watching um, what else comes forward from some of the, you know, really, really great scientists that are down in Miami at the Diabetes Research Institute and um, lots of a lot of exciting work going on there now. And Oh, everyone, a lot of people saying great talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.